Hey, thanks everybody for coming to DBCX. Um, this is our speaker series open free to the public. Uh, students are kind of working on final projects, so they're a little kind of caught up, but I'm really excited to have us out here to, is that Martin? Martin. Martin, uh, to talk about uh, CommuScript. He just knows all over the country around JavaScript related things. Um, so I'm just gonna kick it off over to Zap. So thanks for coming. Hey everybody, thanks for coming. All right. All right. So today's session is about CoffeeScript, the good part. A little bit about myself. My name is Azad, and I've worked at, uh, at the US government, startups and corporations. I'm also an author of six books on Node.js and JavaScript. And I'm a failure enthusiast and a certified yoga teacher. You can find me at azad underscore co on Twitter. Fun story. About a year and a half ago, I used to joke that CafeScript is a problem without a solution, but not anymore, obviously. <laughs> so, just a quick raise of hands. How many of you already use CafeScript? I guess. Okay, one person. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, basically, uh, please be open minded. There is this thing, it's called uh, Black Paradox. Basically, uh, it says that, uh, and the person who described it, Paul Graham, Paul Graham, the founder of YC, basically it said that if developers think in, and use one language, it's very hard for them to think in a different language. So again, be open-minded. I'm saying all this because CoffeeScript has some bad rap, especially, surprisingly, in uh, Node.js de uh, developers circles. But the thing that I've noticed that most of those developers who kind of like quote unquote hate CoffeeScript, they never actually build anything relatively large in CoffeeScript. So my perception of CoffeeScript changed when I uh, joined DocuSign. At DocuSign, we use uh, Node.js, CoffeeScript, Backbone.js, Grunt for building everything. And it took, took me a little bit to, to get used to it, and then I've noted that developers, other developers coming from front-end and .NET uh, stack, just after a few weeks, they don't want to go back to the plain JavaScript. So that's a very good thing. So what is a uh, CoffeeScript? Uh, CoffeeScript is a little language, that's what they have on the website. But if we actually go to the website, it's, it's not that small anymore. And it's actually pretty mature. The latest version is 1.7. Before we dive deep into what's good about CoffeeScript, I would like to remind you what is not so good about native JavaScript. And uh, this is a funny picture somebody made on the internet. So on the left part, you see JavaScript, uh, the definitive guide. And on the right side, you see JavaScript, the good part. <laughs> By the way, the book on the right, I highly recommend it. It will probably take you just four or six hours to read it. So it's considered a classic. So the, there are many things that, not, that are not so great about native JavaScript, but I just picked three of them and highlighted them here just because they are easier to compare with uh, CoffeeScript and how CoffeeScript solved those problems. So the first one is it's kind of very simple, but a lot of beginners, they kind of get uh, bogged down into it. So it's a double equal and triple equal. Double equal will automatically convert the data type, and triple equal will not convert the data type. So it will just try to compare the, data, the existing data type and the value. So it's a one symbol, but it might cause some, some bugs in, uh, in the code. Second item is uh, functional inheritance versus, versus pseudo-classical inheritance. So pseudo-classical, it's, uh, it's very hard to implement and to understand. So most people, myself included, really use functional inheritance in the native JavaScript code. And uh, global variable leakage. So it's very easy to miss a var statement and this will lead to, uh, to exposing your variable instead of making it a private variable, you will create a global variable. And then you might have a name collision and this will lead to bugs. 
and there are many others. So here, here is a very high level overview of the good parts of CoffeeScript. So the syntax is the most, one of the most appealing of them. And I guess most of you are Ruby developers. So for you, CoffeeScript syntax will look very familiar. Uh, curly braces, when we declare functions and when we use object literals, they are optional. Parentheses are optional when we call functions and uh, semicolons are absent. Then we have better function declaration. So instead of writing word function every time, we just use the uh, skinny arrow or fat arrow. And I will just uh, describe the difference between them later. Scoping. So uh, var statements inserted, they're inserted automatically by copy script. So it prevents us from making the, the leakage into global space. And we have iterators. Iterators or comprehensions, they're complete replacements of for loops. And they're uh, more readable and better to write, more fun to use. And then finally, one of the biggest thing is that we have class declarations. And I'll show it to you later. So uh, syntax, the white space and indentation are part of the language. So if we, if we put an extra space, that might affect how the language is compiled. So be careful with that. No semicolons. I think that's a, that's a good thing. And uh, again, object literals and logical blocks don't need to have curly braces. And functional function calls can emit curly and with parentheses. So I personally don't like semicolons because what usually happens, I have some code with semicolons and then I write some code without semicolons because I either rushing or just forget to put semicolons, but my code still works because there is this feature, it's called ASI, automatic semicolon insertion. It's been since the beginning of JavaScript and it's not going to go away. So basically now I have fully functional working code, JavaScript code, but some parts of it use semicolons, other parts don't use semicolons. So it's kind of inconsistent. I like my code to be consistent. Uh, the workaround for this is to use JSLint or some extra step to just lint my code and it will notify me, okay, I've missed some semicolons, but then I have to go and fix those semicolons. So it's like, again, extra work. So take it with a grain of salt. This is my personal perception. There is a lot of controversy around this subject. This is an example of uh, an object literal. As you see, there is no curly braces. You can use curly braces, but it's optional. And we have an object that has two properties, brother and sister. And the values for those properties, they're objects in, in themselves. So uh, in a way, we have nested objects. And uh, the deeper we go, the more indentations, indentation we have. And we, we don't use commas. So the way CoffeeScript detects that it's an object, it looks at the column in the middle, and then it knows it's an object literal declaration. Here are some examples of uh, function calls. The first one is just we're console logging. And as you see, we can emit parentheses. Some developers find this style more readable. Again, you can use parentheses, but um, this looks cleaner and you have to type less characters, which means there, is, there are less chances to create bugs. For example, I've made a lot of bugs just by meeting uh, parentheses at the end, like an extra parenthesis or missing a parenthesis. Second example is we actually pass an object to the function. So we set class active on that uh, jQuery, jQuery object on that DOM element. So as you see, we have two spaces, but CoffeeScript compiler can detect that it's an object because there is a column in the middle. Uh, third example, we can just start on a new line, and then we can have multiple properties in that object. Function declaration. So again, we can use skinny arrows, which are just exactly the same as the function word. And we can use fat arrows, which are more interesting. 
and this is how it looks like. And uh, we can even combine, if we have just one statement in the function, we can put, put it on, on a single line. And on the right side, you see the compiled code. This is an example of, of a skinny arrow. So basically, the output of this, uh, this code is that we have window object printed twice. So the first time it happens in the outer scope, and the second time it happens in the inner scope in the closure. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's a good thing to have, but usually that's not what we want. Usually we want to use the outer scope inside of the function. And what we end up doing, we usually write var self equal this or var that equal this. And uh, with CoffeeScript, we don't have to do all this trickery. CoffeeScript does this for us automatically. All we need to do is just change skinny arrow to fat arrow. And on the right side, you will see that it actually uses underscore this equals this. So now we will have window printed both times. Even in inner scope, we'll have the window scope. Manual vars are banned, so we, the code would not compile if we type var a equal one, if we type var. And the rule by which CoffeeScript compiler determines like where to put those vars, where to declare, is pretty simple. So basically, it's just the first time CoffeeScript compiler encounters that variable, it will declare that variable in that scope. Here's an example. So here's an example of why this, this might be bad. So for example, on the left side, we have bad code. I just forgot to type var b, so just b equals 10. And uh, what happened? b now is a global variable. It became window.d. But that's not what we wanted. We wanted to keep B private, as you see in a, in a good example. And you might imagine bad scenarios if we use some common word like counter or total, and we have two libraries, and they overwrite in each other because the name is so common. This is how, how CoffeeScript solves this problem. So. Uh, if you look at the B, the first time we encounter it is the outer scope, and that's where it's defined. And in the compiled code, we see that uh, the inner function just uses that uh, outer scope B. It's not redefined. But as soon as we remove that line, so the first time B is encountered, it's encountered inside of that function, now we have two variables. We have two variable declarations. Iterators and comprehension is another good thing. Personally, I like them a lot. Uh, great, great way to save time. Uh, these two guys, they're examples of how we can iterate over an array and an object. Pretty similar, just change in to off, off for objects, in for arrays, and then we'll get key, key value and item index. And uh, in the compiled code, it's just good old for loop with a dot length property. So there is no magic, but it's a great time saver and it's way better to read. Another good thing is that oftentimes, and we will also see it in the if conditions, that um, we can flip, we can actually write the function first. So iterator is just a function, and we pass item as a parameter, and uh, we just move it from the back to the front, and then our comprehension goes. And on the last line, you will see you see when. So the when item equals zero, what it does basically it works as a filter. So we only pass positive numbers to the function to the iterator function. The so last but not least is class declaration. So as I've said, pseudo-classical inheritance patterns very cumbersome. You have to type prototype, you have to like use new keywords, you have to capitalize names. So a lot of people, just especially beginners, they don't understand how it works. And um, CoffeeScript makes it very easy 
to use classes. And uh, with libraries like Backbone.js that rely on classes, this comes uh, very useful. We also get constructor and super. Constructor, if you're familiar with Java, it, it works like initialize. So it's some piece of code that will be executed before the object is created, before the object is instantiated. And um, then we have super call. So for example, in a child class, if we override one of the methods, we can execute the logic from the parent class by calling super. So here's an example of uh, class vehicle. We have a constructor, which basically assigns name as an attribute of that class. And then we have method move that just prints, prints the name value and then some text. Uh, and you can note that uh, I used interpolation here. So basically, if you, put, if you need to print variable, you put it in a double quoted string. And then you start it with the hash and the curly brace. So that's very convenient if you have some dynamic text and you want to mix and match like regular text and variables. And uh, this will output camera, camera moved 50 miles. Just for, for fun, I uh, compared uh, how many lines that code will be in native code, so it's like twice more lines. And uh, it's not as easy to, to read and understand. We have all those like prototype keywords, function keywords. Some of the other good things, uh, splats, we can pass multiple variables when we don't know how many of those variables we need to pass. For example, it could be two one time, could be 10 the other time. So what we do, we just put an ellipsis at the end. Uh, conditions, if statements, are more, more readable because they use uh, the actual English language instead of weird symbols like ampersand and uh, exclamation mark. And um, remember that double equal versus triple equal. So in CafeScript, it's solved by just eliminating double equal. So now all we have is like we type is, I, S, and we have triple equal all the time. Uh, arrays also more convenient to work with. We just put square braces and two dots, and that will create an array from 1 to 10, or we can slide that array with the same syntax. And there are more good things, but I just picked a few of them to, to make my case. Uh, so basically, here's a summary of what we just went through. I think the most important is comprehensions, class declaration, function declaration, and syntax is just all everywhere. So some of you might wonder, so if CoffeeScript is so awesome, why no, not everybody is using it? What are the bad parts, right? Of course, there's always some bad parts. So it actually takes some learning to understand CoffeeScript. So people usually just attempt to write it. It's like, oh, this is cool. And then they just give up. So just spend one or two days, read some books. There are four good free online books on CoffeeScript. Invest some time, and it, it will be better and more fun to work with CoffeeScript if you do it. Another not so good thing is that uh, CoffeeScript is not executed in the browser. So the, our good old JavaScript, native JavaScript, is executed in the browser. So we need an extra step. We need a compilation step to compile CoffeeScript into JavaScript. So it probably will require setting up Grunt or Gulp or something similar. But it's a good thing to have anyway for minification and other purposes. Uh, the parentheses sometimes, the, the optionality of them might lead to some weird cases. And um, I've included a link to my blog post about these cases. It's on webupblog.com. Uh, and debugging might be a pain in the tail once in a while. But uh, at DocuSign, we didn't have that many problems even without source maps, usually. You just kind of like understand what context that is. And then in Sublime, we have a CoffeeScript plugin in Sublime. So I would just compile it in Sublime and look the line number in Sublime. 
Uh, this is a list of uh, things, like a future things from one of the CoffeeScript uh, core contributors, like things you want in CoffeeScript. Uh, or Sam checking out. So how to get started with CoffeeScript? How many of you use NPM? Okay, so you just go into your terminal, type npm install dash g coffee dash script. Coffee is something different, so coffee dash script is the thing we want. And then after that's done, just type coffee and you'll get a prompt. And uh, you can play around, but this is exactly the same tool that you will be using with your grant. So the same tool for compilation and for console. Companies that already use uh, CoffeeScript, GitHub, Dropbox, DocuSign, Airbnb. So it's very good for enterprises. If, you, if this session sounds interesting for you, you can check out my blog post, CoffeeScript Fundamentals. And uh, these are four free online books that I've mentioned. I personally read the first one. It's very short and nice and sweet. Highly recommend it. Of course, for pretty much all good and popular things, there are alternatives. Some of the alternatives uh, listed here, Dart is one of them, but I think it's kind of in, in its early stage of development. It still uh, haven't reached 1.0 1 version. Uh, type, TypeScript is another alternative for those of you who like Microsoft products. Uh, ECMAScript 6 is, is good, amazing. It's, uh, it's coming soon and it's actually borrowed a lot of things from CoffeeScript. It borrowed skinny arrows, it borrowed uh, a lot of things. So, but it's not available yet. In all browser, of course, the, there will be like cross-browser and um, all browser support issues. And uh, Sweet.js, it's my personal favorite among the alternative. It's kind of like you can write your own coffee script, like a small coffee script with Sweet.js. It's a library for writing macros. So basically you write code that writes code. Uh, so conclusions. It's good for large teams because it's very easy to kind of like agree on the conventions way easier than native JavaScript and uh, GitHub even published their uh, style code. Anybody could go and uh, check it out. And uh, it's also good for developers new to JavaScript, especially people coming from uh, object-oriented programming languages like Java and Ruby. Uh, Cross-browser and all-browser support is better. For example, for each method is not available in all browsers, but uh, if, if we just use the comprehensions in CoffeeScript, CoffeeScript will automatically like, include all the like fallback scenarios. And it's tested, it's robust, very mature, available now, and it's awesome with Backbone.js and uh, underscore JS because they were written by the same person. Yeah, just a summary of our session. Any questions, thoughts, experiences? Uh, I was curious what you were saying a little bit earlier about the comparison to was it ECMAScript six yeah. with that being on the horizon and um, particularly how it's you know borrowing stuff or what it's seen in uh, what's popular with CoffeeScript. I'm curious if they start to implement things like that, um, do you still see like CoffeeScript doing enough to make itself seem worthwhile, so to speak? Is that kind of taking these big parts that make CoffeeScript really favorable? Um, do you think it still has enough going on for, for people to still see CoffeeScript as um, you know, worth the investment? If the CoffeeScript will evolve, and I think it will evolve during like the, the next year. So, and um, it, it's also more like individual case, right? So you pick whatever you like, and if all you care about is classes, and or like uh, skinny errors, and you have that in ECMA 6, so yeah. So it's more a case by case basis, but for projects right now, I would just stick with CoffeeScript and let it hope for it. It's final, but it's still like it's not here yet. Right. So you said um, 
copy script uh, will basically compile and put in all the like cross browser functionality. Is that like across the board? So like if I was running something that's like not available and like you know you need like an IE8 fallback or whatever, like copy script does that, or it's like there's certain cases where it does, certain cases where it doesn't. Uh, it will compile, yeah, into into the most compatible code. <laughs> So for example, at DocuSign, we have to support IE8 because a lot of banks still use IE8. Yeah. So some modern browsers, like functions like Forage, for example, it's, it's I think it's only started like uh, since IE9. Right. Yeah. So for those cases, it would not use that method. It would use Forward. Does it compile into like the most performant like? Oh yes, it's also yeah. that that yeah I forgot to mention yeah. It's also kind of like, so the, the recent version, I think since 1.6, they started doing like this optimization. So Kafka script will like analyze what you're trying to do and pick the most efficient strategy based on what you're trying to do. For example, well, that's not a good example, but um, it, it's a good example in terms of like, to show you how smart it is. So if I create an array of 20 elements, it will just list them like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 20. But if it's 21, it will create a loop and then will iterate 21 times. That's a very like, basic example, but it's, it's, getting more, uh, it's getting smarter and more efficient. Yeah. So you point out that usually you'll use it to compile something, correct? I just want to point out you can include the copy script uh, yeah. compiler as a script source, so you can actually can use it. I don't know if you usually wouldn't ever want to do this, but I actually have a case. I wrote uh, TDCSS, and it, it will evaluate copy script. What is, TD, CSS. what is TDSS? So it's a style guide generator, and okay. if you have styles that, say you have a backbone view that you're plopping in, and it has some CSS styles, and you want to see what do my buttons look like, we use CopyScript in my work, and so I had the need just last week to make that work with TDCSS. And so they, why so why did you choose the on-fly approach? So on-fly approach, you just include it in the like a normal library in the browser, and uh, it will compile on the fly. So there is no compilation step, right? That's what I did. So why could you just give a reason why yeah, so the would way somebody TDCSS choose TDCSS works? Not to go digress, but it will evaluate an HTML page and look at your HTML comments. Uh, most style guide generators require you to put CSS comments, and then they'll parse that out and then spit out the style guide. This one uses the HTML comments. So what we wanted to be able to do is have the copy script in line and then show a snippet of copy script. Um, so, so as opposed to creating So you just needed something to uh, to compile CopyScript on the browser. Right, and, without, and that was one oh. way to do that. And I'm not the original author, I'm a core contributor, so I didn't want to diverge from his philosophy of having it lean and mean and you include you drop it in the browser and it just works. So yeah. sounds like it. yeah, sounds like a good reason, but more like an edge case rather than like real Yeah. Really standard, I would say standard I, for project. It's, it's interesting, yeah. yeah. Usually, you would you wouldn't want to yeah. include it. And the reason because it's just slower. Yeah. You know. But this is nice because you can include it like straight from your files. Yeah. No. But yeah, it's an edge case for sure. Yeah. Good point. And you can just go to like CafeScript.org, and uh, that's what they do. Right? Yeah. That's yeah. how I figured you can out just what e doing. execute CafeScript right away in the browser. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any way to alternate between CoffeeScript and JavaScript in the same program. So say you wanted to use an ECMAScript 6 feature that wasn't in CoffeeScript. Is, is there any way to do that where you know, the bulk of your code is CoffeeScript and then you have a little mm -hmm. part that's done? There is a Browserify. Are you familiar with Browserify? So Browserify is like a library that you can, um, so basically you can use NPM modules for front end development with Browserify. So yeah, just Google Browserify. And uh, there's a Browserify plugin that will allow you to have 
uh, JavaScript and CoffeeScript files and just mix them. You know. Just to address his question, if you're using Rails, the asset pipeline let you do exactly that just by uh, having different subheadings, different uh, file identifiers, and in your application assets directory, you would then have, uh, like, for let's say a user page, you would have users.js.coffee, and that gives you your coffee stuff, and then users.js.ecma or whatever, and the asset pipeline will precompile so you have the associated gems. And then it will ship it all in minified JS to the browser. Uh, each file you add, of course, means you're now sending more files to the browser. So you have performance trade-offs there, but it's entirely possible to do that with the Rails app. Yeah, actually, I just I just thought right now, uh, maybe maybe we can just have like two files: one JavaScript and one compiled JavaScript from CoffeeScript, right? Does it make sense? So like in the HTML script tag, we include native JavaScript file, and then we include the native JavaScript file compiled from CoffeeScript. So what I, what I actually had in mind, and I didn't know if this was at all possible, would be some kind of escape code that says, you know, what's between these two oh, points yeah. is, yeah, there is this yeah. six or something. There is, I don't remember syntax because I rarely use it, but yeah, you just use some symbols and then you start writing native JavaScript. I'm a little confused. So, like, I thought a CoffeeScript file, you can write all the JavaScript you want inside a CoffeeScript file, right? No. no? You For example, var, you cannot write var. Oh, right. You cannot write semicolon. But if you use that special escape sequence, you can write. Yeah, yeah there is one. I can look it up later and tell. Any other questions? Yeah? Are there any kind of gotchas or things to be particularly mindful of when uh, testing uh, with CoffeeScript? When using it or when writing code? What do you mean by testing? Yeah, just like when, you, when you're testing like either Jasmine or Mocha or things like that. I know it's compiled into JS, but is there just anything that you've experienced that you have to like kind of be mindful of when primarily using CoffeeScript in testing? The most things uh, that cause me pain, I've listed here in my uh, blog post. Here's the link, CoffeeScript quirks. And uh, most, most of the time they're due to the like, missing parentheses because now it's treated like a one, one, one parameter instead of being multiple parameters. So, yeah. But other than that, I mean, maybe debugging like, sometimes could be tricky. Yeah. So who is uh, planning to play with CoffeeScript after tonight's talk? Good. <laughs>